Hello everyone and welcome back to Mass Appeal with Kansas City T-Bones manager John Massarelli. Mass Appeal is a weekly program that gives you, the fans, the opportunity to ask the Kansas City manager questions about the T-Bones, baseball or sports in general, or just seek John's wisdom about life events. In this week's episode, John talks to us about the hitting of his team, he shares with us some baseball insights, and John helps a guy trying to save his marriage. So let's get right to Mass Appeal. So let's welcome back Kansas City manager John Massarelli. John, let's first of all begin with some team updates you have for us this week. Um, not a lot going on. We're um, we're still battling some injury. Uh, Gallus and uh, Leonida behind the plate, both dealing with some past labor issues that they're trying to uh, work through. Uh, and it's just more of the daily grind of that 21 days in a row where it starts wearing on them a little bit. Uh, hopefully get Nate Hembring back here shortly. Um, so once we get him back, uh, you know, we should be healthy and ready to roll. Yeah, Jeremy Strawn returned back, and boy, did he look good on Wednesday. He did. He's, he's got good stuff. I mean, we had to, you know, we were lucky to say we thought we had six quality starters, and, you know, he was kind of the odd man out early. He was just struggling a little bit in the first couple starts. We had to make a decision. We got him in there the other day in relief of Barnes, and he looked out scanning like the old Jeremy Strong. And uh, I don't think it would be too long before he finds his way back into the rotation. Yeah, I think five no-hit innings that he pitched. Really impressive. Well, let us start with our fan questions for this week. So we first of all begin with Kyle from Kansas City who says, Mass, let me first say big fan. The team has shown a lot of power so far, but has not hit for much average. Is this cause for concern, or you just see this as early season slump? Um, you know, usually the first 20, 30 games, I'm never really concerned with our team batting average. Uh, it's always, I'm just looking for the approaches. For instance, you look at Vladimir Frias, uh, who hit 340 in this league. He's, you know, hitting two bucks right now. I mean, he's not a 200 hitter. Uh, so you don't see, you just look at their trends over their careers. Uh, you know, Jake Blackwood uh, is a 300 hitter in this league. So you, you got a lot of guys with uh, that haven't been playing one or two years. They've been playing six, seven, eight years. So they have a history, and, and you like to think uh, you know, once we get to that halfway point that they'll be up close to their uh, career averages. Yeah, you know, one of the things that Jake was talking to me about, he said that's kind of a a frustrating but a challenge that you have to overcome mentally is you can do everything right and get no no benefit out of it at all. So I would assume it's kind of, because I've watched him hit, and he's been hitting really well. I mean, the team in general has hit well. It's just not falling in for you. Right, and that's why you go on that experience where you, you know you're not worried about a Vladdy or a, a Jake being, or, or even a Tyler Massey who was hitting about a buck ten for a while. Uh, or even under that, I don't think you got to hit the first six games. I mean, those guys have been through it, so you're not really as concerned. You're concerned a little bit more on the younger guys. And, you know, Brandon Tierney got off to a great start, but you'd be concerned if he got off to a slow start because then he'd have that little doubt whether he could compete at this league, and he's obviously proven he can or, or swing over the hot start. So the fact that we had some rookies get off the hot starts is more uh, positive to me than the veterans having gotten off to a positive, you know, a, a fast start, so to speak. But I think they'll come around. Jim from Olath would like to know, who was the T-Bone's rival in the American Association? T-Bone's rival? Well, of course, you got to go to the, you know, to get to the playoffs, you got to win the division. And so, you know, Lincoln and Gary, uh, and obviously Sioux City, who won it with 75 wins last year, are the teams you got to beat head-to-head. Uh, I know we, the, the organization, we'd like to make rivals with Wichita because they're from the same state, and Joplin because they're from Missouri. Uh, I wish we'd play them more. To be honest, I wish we were in the South. Uh, heck, we go to Laredo twice anyway. Uh, just we'd have two closer trips than going up north in our division. But you know, I'd like to see us develop more of a rivalry with a Joplin or a Wichita. Where we're playing them two, three, four times a season. That makes good sense. Zach from Liberty has a good question, which uh, I is big, big in uh, Major League Baseball these days. He says, Skipper, I don't really get all these unwritten rules about bat flips and watching home runs. Can a guy enjoy hitting a home run without fear that he is going to be beamed? It's amazing, Zach, how the game has changed just since I was playing, or even my father in the 60s in the minor leagues. I mean, this game, in the, in the, when it started in the 20s, it was a gentleman's game. Uh, and it wasn't until, like, Ty Cobb started spiking people 
that uh, people started getting, you know, intense, adding intensity. But even with the intensity through the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, there were just unwritten rules that have been gone through the history of the game, like, uh, you know, not showing the other team up, not running when you're up, you know, five, six, seven runs, depending on the how much time is left game in the game. Uh, just not showing up your opponent. That was just always part of the game, even when I was taught the game in the 80s, 70s, and 80s, 90s. Uh, and it's just amazing how it's changed now uh, with the bat flips and the people getting upset when you're pitching inside. It's funny that and I throw it on the hitters. The hitters want to put on this show when they hit a home run, but yet they're going to glare at a pitcher when they throw inside, and then they're going to glare at a pitcher if he fist pump them after he strikes them out. So if, so if a batter's allowed to sit there and just why can't a pitcher fist pump and stare at the pit batter back at him? They want it both ways. And so I just don't like the trend that's gone, and who knows where it's going to end up. Did, now you can't even slide hard. Can't even slide around in second base anymore. Are, are you? I'm sorry, but are you in favor of of them kind of? I mean, pitchers kind of taking charge on the mound in that way, or no? I'm in favor of pitching inside without fear of the batter glaring at me. Uh, I'm in favor of not acting like you've done it before when you hit a home run and run around the bases. Uh, I'm just not into all this showboat. Well, there's a lot of people in favor of what you're saying, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I know the fans love it. The fans love it, but the players—you know—they just—they're not playing the game every day. Like the players, these guys are—you know—don't like getting shown up like that. That's just part of the part of the game that's gotten away from us. You know, you see this a lot in other sports where a guy will start doing some weird touchdown dance or whatever, and they talk about. Um, hey, act like you've been there before. And that's a phrase that you used. Do, do you see that there's just a, a, a trend going towards wanting it to be more about the individual than about the sport or the team itself? No doubt. It's just come down to contracts and money and endorsements and, uh, you know, your, your five seconds of fame. And, you know, and uh, Batista did that in the playoffs last year. The, the ultimate bat flip. I mean, that, that, that's going to make people mad that are on the other side competing at the highest level. I mean, these are competitors at the, at the highest level of their sport, and they don't like to get shown up like that. They just gave up a game-winning home run. You know, enjoy it and run around the bases. That makes perfect sense. Tyler, I, I managed against Batista when he was an A-ball, and he sure didn't act like that when he was an A-ball. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. No. Interesting. Tyler from Emporia would like to know who has been your favorite player to manage in your career. My favorite player, I have a couple of them. I'm gonna have to go with two. Thinking about this, Brooks Conrad, who played in the big leagues, he's the utility guy for the. I know I saw him up with the Braves. He was with me with the Astros in 01, 02, and 03, and he was just an old school, didn't wear batting gloves, pine tar up to. Just got all out of his ability. And the other guy in independent ball who played in the Giants system is Andrew Davis, who played with me in Lake Erie for four years. Uh, again, same type of player. Uh, just an old school, uh, play the game hard, play the game right kind of guys. Uh, they gave you everything they had all the time. Uh, I tell you who's going in that realm right now is that and watch Tyler Massey. Uh, for us, Tyler Massey plays the game the right way and uh, it's is on the path to being one of my favorites, even though we're only 20 games in. <laughs> well, he's making a big impression right off. Yes, he has. He's made a good first impression. Next up, we have Lynn from Kansas City, who would like to know, was it hard to walk away from playing, and how did you know when it was your time? Uh, good question. Um, it had to do more with family for me, I think, uh my daughter was born when I was in my fifth or sixth season of professional baseball, and my first year in AAA. And I kind of told myself and told my wife that uh, by the time she starts first grade, if I'm not established in the big leagues, uh, you know, I'm going to walk away and not, you know, put my family through that. And well, lo and behold, I spent five more years in AAA after that. 
And as she's as she's getting ready to start uh, kindergarten, I had an offer to go overseas and thought it would be a great opportunity for our family. So we went over to Taiwan for a season and played. Wow. Uh, I had a great experience. And at that point, I she was starting first grade or kindergarten. I can't remember kindergarten, I think. And I, and I was at the point then where it gets harder to train to play at that level. And so it was an easy decision for me to walk away, even though physically I was, I could have probably kept playing. Uh, so I still passion for the game. So obviously went into the coaching from that. That's awesome. That must have been a tough decision, but that sounds like the right one for you. Right. It, it was tough, but it wasn't. I, you know, it wasn't one I just thought, of, you know, it was something that was in my mind through those five years as my daughter was growing. Henry would like she to know. Me. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say she wanted me to stay home. Well, you can't my blame her. Did. You can't blame her. Right. <laughs> Henry would like to know who you see making it to the World Series this season. The World Series this season, I'm going to say the American League Central Division champ will be one team. Look, I see I left it vague. <laughs> <laughs> we know who you're talking about. <laughs> I like the Royals because I'm... I just love their organization when Dayton Moore has. I'm also from Cleveland. I like to see how, you know, I am deep down, I always root for Cleveland. Uh, even though I'm, we're all in the same, generally don't root for your hometown when you, once you're in pro ball for a while. You, uh, but I like the American League Central Division champ, and you can't walk away from the Cubs pitching. It's just hard. You know, you look at. If I, when you're a manager and you have that pitching staff, it's hard to look bad. <laughs> you're always making good decisions when you're throwing out those arms every night. Absolutely. I, mean, I think they'd be really tough to beat in a series. Are, are you uh, in, in believing that LeBron's going to pull it out for Cleveland then? Believe land, Rob. Believe land. Say it. <laughs> Believe land. Awesome. Believe land. <laughs> that is Awesome. Paul from Lawrence would like to know, what is your favorite part about playing baseball? My favorite part was always, uh, as a catcher, the uh, relationship with your pitcher during the game and making a decision in the game based on uh, what you're seeing from the hitter. That's probably the biggest thing I've learned uh, in this game, and it's helped me the most in managing, is learning how to read swings at the plate and what to call next. And so that was always the thing I enjoyed about the game is, you know, making a call, whether it's the eighth, ninth inning off their best hitter and making the, the right call on the pitch and watching the guy swing and miss or get the result that you were expecting. Uh, you know, it's one of those things that the fans never see. It doesn't show up in the box score, whether you got two hits or no hits, uh, but it's a, just the relationship you have with your pitcher, how you knew you beat, you, you won the battle right there. That was probably my favorite part. That's excellent. We have a couple of uh, baseball skills-related questions for you. First of all, Adam from Topeka would like to know, do you have tips on how to improve a person's eye at the plate? Um, well, I can remember as a kid putting, uh, talk about physical and then mental, I remember putting a, a white pack on the end of a pencil eraser and then bringing it closer to my eye and hard and soft focusing on it to improve my eye strength. Uh, I don't know if I got that from Pete Rose in a book or something. I can remember doing that. For, that's the first thing I thought of when I read that question. Uh, but really, to, to improve your discipline at the plate, you can't improve your eye at the plate without a consistent approach. So that's where it starts. When you're consistently trying to do the same thing in the batter's box, that's when you'll have the strike zone discipline he's asking about. Uh, you can't have one before the other, uh, so that's really the the thing you need you need to focus on is consistently thinking the same thing in the box, whether it's driving the ball through the middle of the field or looking for a ball in a certain area. Without when you're not thinking about that consistently, you're not going to have good discipline at the plate. Is that the kind of thing you see when a player seems out of rhythm that they're not doing that? Yes, that's exactly what they're doing. Whether they're thinking about their mechanics or they're thinking about this certain pitch and what they're going to do with it. They, they start thinking about other things. But when a hitter's in rhythm and really hot, he's not thinking at all up there. He's just reacting because he's trying to do the same thing. He knows his stroke's good. He's 
looking for a fastball or a pitch he likes to hit out of the plate, and he just goes up there and does that, and then his mechanics take over. Uh, but as soon as the brain starts uh, changing that, well, you're thinking this and that, now you're not doing something consistently. Now you're chasing balls out of the zone, whether it's in or out or up or down, and all of a sudden you, you think your swing's messed up, and it's not. <laughs> your brain is. That's very interesting. Jenny from Kansas City would like to know, do you offer teachings at your baseball school that would help girls in softball? Of course. We uh, teach the ABCs for the, for the girls, too. We've had numerous girls go on to play college uh, ball and even uh, get in tryouts for Team USA over the course um, of course of those 20 years we've been operating. Uh, the misnomer out there, Jenny, is that it's a different swing. It is not a different swing. It's the same swing except the girls have to be better just because the ball is coming at a different plane up. If the girls have any breakdown in their mechanics, they're going to miss, miss. Where the boys, they can have a breakdown and still hit the ball. Oh, that's fascinating. Because of the plane, because of the plane that it's coming on. Wow. Uh, we now turn to a question which John will explain to us. Joe from Canton asks, did he go? Did he go? That has my old client Joe Scafidi out there. Um, his son, Big Jake Scafidi, is one of our clients, one of my clients that I work with all the time, and we love to rib him about uh, anything. Uh, for instance, I love to tell him that I'm a big Curry fan and that the, that the school <laughs> State's going to beat the Cavs just to get under his skin, and it does because he's a huge Cleveland fan. So what we do with Big Jake is every time there's a check swing on him, I'll yell out, did he go? And someone in the other cage that's not even watching, one of the instructors are going to say, yes, he did. <laughs> and Jake gets so mad, <laughs> it just cracks us up. It's a good source of entertainment for us in the course of the lesson. That sounds great. Next up is Tom from Kansas City, who uh, Tommy, who asked a question that I think a lot of kids these days are wanting to know. So he says, Mr. Massarelli, I was wondering if you could help. I play baseball and love the sport, but the parents are ruining it for myself and my teammates. They argue about everything and are constantly complaining. How can we tell our parents to tone it down because they are taking all the fun out of it? <laughs> well, I think you could say it just like that, Tommy. And if they don't listen to that, then I don't know what's wrong with them. Or you could, or you could boycott. You could tell your parents, you're either going to sit down by the right field fence, behind the fence, away from all the other parents, or not come at all, or I'm not playing today. <laughs> Go on strike. I like That's that. What I do. <laughs> That's a and good we'll choice. see how that, if it's for them or if it's for the kids. Tommy, that's good advice for you there. Okay. <laughs> Our last question comes from a, a person who identifies himself as guy needing help. He says, Skipper, it's the 11th anniversary coming up for my wife and I, and she told me that the last three years I have blown it when it comes to anniversary presents. Suggestions? Come on. <laughs> Aren't there any romantics out there? I guess where they need I a little help. I just celebrated my 26th with my high school sweetheart, Kelly, and my 25th, I had the priest that married us show up, who happens to be the principal and her boss, show up in her classroom with me uh, and renewed our vows with flowers. I had flowers, and then surprised her with a trip to New York City to see a play. Wow! On my on my fifteenth, we did the same thing, but went to Toronto. Drove to Toronto for a weekend away. Uh, I think I think on our eleventh, if I remember, we did uh, the Ritz Carlton in Cleveland, and we had a champagne and when we showed up in the room there was a champagne whatever their uh, anniversary uh, gift package is it was there waiting for my wife so you gotta gotta think with the heart man <laughs> that sounds like great advice john thanks for joining us this week all right rod thanks for having me we want to thank Manager John Massarelli for joining us on Mass Appeal this week. If you have your own questions you'd like to ask the Kansas City T-Bones manager, please send them to us at askjohn at minorleaguesportsupport.com. That's askjohn at minorleaguesportsupport.com. Please have your questions to us by Thursday so we can give the skipper a little time to review them before we record the show. 
I want to thank you for joining us this week. I'm Rob Pinnear, the Managing Editor of the Minor League Sports Report, and we'll see you next time on Mass Appeal.